Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Rebel, one of the imaging fellows, and I'm going to be presenting uh, some cases for our CAT uh, correlation conference uh, today, along with my wonderful co-fellows, Anish and Wibig. Um So I have a few cases. I ask that we hold uh, questions till all three of us have presented, just so in the interest of time, uh, hopefully we'll carve out some time for Q&A at the very end. So I'm going to jump right into it. My first case is a 53-year-old gentleman. His past medical history is significant for diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and stroke. Uh, he comes in with typical cardiac chest pain. You know, it's worse with exertion, abates with rest, uh, presents to the emergency department. His high sun troponin is flat, and his EKG is unremarkable. Um, so as part of his ischemic workup in a patient with a very um, significant story and history, uh, he gets a cardiac PET. Um, so these are our resting, um, these are our static images. So for those of you, uh, just to orient, uh, the top is our stress and the bottom are our rest portion, uh, rest images. And Victor, do you want to help me uh, figure out the, the perfusion defect or? Yeah. So if you look at the, I think, inferior, uh, inferior lateral, yeah. actually from um, base to base yeah. to it, that's pretty yeah. much it looks like it's reversible. So I would say yeah. maybe medium sized, um, could be reversible defect in the inferior <laughs> lateral yeah. or makes me concern for either like so surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it looks, looks like, like single vessel, would you agree? Um, yeah, so great, great point. Great point, Dr. Malawati. So um, again, these are gated images. So now we're kind of imaging the ventricle at peak hyperkinemia. At the top of the stress, as well as assessing the oxygen level, our stress is at the peak elevation at the time of the VM draw. Um, another piece of information is that the peak flows were reduced in most territories, and it was actually 1.6. Um, and then another thing that I want to point out on our uh, static images, if I don't know if it's projecting well, but the RV uptake is more intense on stress versus rest, which is also a marker of high-risk stenosis or multivessel disease. It's not very specific, but kind of putting it all together, uh, this is how we read it. We read that there was a large size defect, just like Victor had mentioned. It's reversible. Uh, looks like a single vessel disease. However, incorporating the fact that the EF drop with stress, there was TID, uh, which is cavity dilation with stress, and there was increased RV uptake. Uh, this was concerning for multivessel or extensive disease. Uh, so the patient underwent a coronary angiogram, and it was significant, like thousand, I want to say. Yeah, yeah. So that's, again, great point. That's going to also something we incorporate with our studies, too, um, and also tipped us off to this being a more extensive disease. So the circ, as you can tell, is occluded, and um, I'm just going to quickly cycle through some of the... other left images. The LED was called significant and severe as well, 70%. And the RCA was also quite nasty. And so putting it all together, this patient had uh, a diagnosis of multivessel disease, underwent an evaluation <laughs> for cabbage, and got revascularized. Yes, Dr. Dr. Oh, oh, I said you said wait for the questions at the end, or can we? Uh, uh, I can make an exception for you. <laughs> yes. The no, question for someone with effort-related chest pain, negative high sensitivity proponent, and high-risk non-invasive functional testing, yeah. does yeah. this guy have stable? So if you just incorporated it in the history, I think he comes under the category of unstable angina. So I feel like, you know, he had no symptoms and it all started two days ago. And so that tells me that, you know, something changed and the, the pack is unstable. And then you incorporate that with the fact that, you know, the stress test was so uh, positive. Um, I put that together as an acute syndrome or some or some of So, I mean, if you're implying that whether this patient is an ischemia trial patient, this patient would not be admitted, would not be included in the trial because
was any ACS hospitalization within the past two months would exclude them. But if you go back to the images, so this is like where the flow, the absolute flow makes a difference in there. So if you look at the static images, it was a single, it appeared as single vessel disease. When in reality, everything was ischemic. The most ischemic was the inferior wall. So on relative imaging, you would think this is a single vessel disease. But if you go to the absolute quantification, you can see that the worst lesion is in the RCA. But the, like you can see the augmentation is worse in the RCA. Although the LED augmented a little bit, but still it within lower numbers. So you can see that flow here, the global flow is helping you kind of sort out one vessel versus multi vessel. Thank you for your contribution. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, my next case, but just you know, summarize the take-home messages, incorporate all the data, look at your flows, look at the EF between rest and stress, look at your calcium score, uh, the TID, and incorporate that with your reading, and that may change. You know, This patient changed from single vessel disease to multi vessel disease based on those findings. Uh, my next case is a 35-year-old gentleman. He is undergoing a renal transplant evaluation, and as part of his listing for a renal transplant, and ischemic evaluation was pursued. Um, so these are his uh, images. Any of the general fellows want to help me? Uh, okay, that's all right. Um, so again, the... Oh no, he's uh, I have I have full confidence. <laughs> <laughs> so I do see a reversible um, defect which appears pretty large, mostly from mid to apical, but all of the all of the territories actually looks pretty global. Um, there, especially if you look at the HLA uh, images in the nebulae as well. So I would probably say either it's um, very up around LED or very good. Hold that thought. Let notice, me show you. What do you notice about the uh, thickness of the mitochondria? It, uh, it looks like the apical, uh, especially the apical segments, they thin out after uh, stress. And at rest? And at rest, they, they seem pretty thick. So this could be something like um, the apical skin. Very good. Very good. He says, wonderful. Um, these are the gated images. And so, uh, on peak stress, we can see that the uh, mid to distal segments uh, thin out. They're essentially akinetic. The bases are thick and contracting. The EF essentially doesn't really augment. It was 51 at stress and rest. And really, if you've really uh, protocoled and you've uh, processed these images perfectly, the EF we expect at least um, to augment at least 5%. Um, um, and and so that's also something that can take me off a little bit. bit. Um, these are the flows, and uh, just want to point out that the global flow reserve was 1.3. So 2 is normal. Anything less than 1.5 is severely reduced, and this was 1.3. And the peak flows are very severely reduced, and they're reduced in all uh, territories. Um, and so Isa mentioned this could be apical HCM versus metodicell AD. Um, and I withheld a piece of his past medical history, which is that he had this echo with apical HCM. And so we knew this when we were looking at the PET, and essentially the conundrum was, do we just report this as a ischemia due to apical HCM versus true LAD disease? And essentially, we said, we, you know, that's the differential, but given that the calcium score was very high, most of it was in the LAD, we had TID, we had this kind of drop in, you know, lack of augmentation of EF, um, and risk factors such as end-stage renal disease, we said that patient needs to get an anatomical scan afterwards. Yes. The EKG had like classic Yamaguchi kind of uh, sign, kind of like that deep TV of inversions in the apical. Yeah, yeah. Was that the CT? The calcium score was uh, pretty high. That's why we didn't do the CT. I don't have it in my, no, 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 I don't. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll just talk again. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say is, you know, the LVEF of 50% that you got on the pet doesn't match what we see on the echo. Yeah, and also yeah. visually, you can see the cavity is obliterated just yeah, on the stress, yeah, uh, yeah. on the gated PET images. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if it's fair game to honestly use the lack
lack of augmentation of yeah. the EF to, to say, oh, it's been being used by the car dealer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, before I see the cat, I mean, yeah. it's a transplant evaluation, so we know he's a high-risk patient. Yeah, yeah. But what if, what if he has a bunch of, you know, diffuse disease and he has some lesions? Yeah, yeah. Can you really um, differentiate the epicardial versus microvascular uh, contribution? see that this is the worst reduced here but even these are also reduced because if you look here for example that's the scale and uh, for example here you got like two is here so you got still also the area that's not diffuse it's not as this area that's not diffuse it still also have some reduction in the flow so mm -hmm. when you see that I mean this is also a hallmark of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mm -hmm. so I think in these patients, if you know that they have it, <coughs> I think the imaging may not be very helpful. Yeah. And because they will have the fusion defect, they will have reduced flow, and probably you need to do an anatomical study in these patients to sort out if they have obstetrics <coughs> or not. It's going to be next to impossible to tease out how much epicardial disease it is and how much yeah. is microvascular. Yeah. What about the, if we use the MRI? This is an yeah. 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 Like the cavity size because it's a 3D data set, so you, you, you're able to look at the entire same as you do on MRI and 3D echo. Well, obviously, the resolution is a little bit less than other modalities, and you also look at thickening in terms of wall motion, so thickening and the overall cavity for ejection fraction. But I mean, data is usually good, maybe not in these type of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where. There is probably an underestimation, especially in the apical segments. And uh, the change from stress to rest is still relative, right? Like even if you're underestimating or overestimating, the change is still relative. Lack of augmentation, I think, still has some value. Yeah, and we'll talk about why we see what we see uh, in some upcoming slides in terms of like the cavity sense, especially. So let's look at his coronary angiogram. So far, not very excited with the LED. It's just there's some bridging, otherwise normal. Gonna quickly cycle through the left segments. Um, and the RCA had a moderate disease that was not significant by FFR. Um, so essentially, you know, let's take a few minutes and you guys talk, you know, already asked some really good questions about why we see what we see in these patients. And in, in patients with HCM, if they have normal epicardial disease, why do we see this kind of ischemia? And it's part of it is there is lack of augmentation of blood flow with response to stress, and it's more at the microvascular level. Um, and when we see that TID, it's apparent TID. There's actually subendocardial ischemia. If you look at that cavity, you know, try to imagine that it's the same cavity, but that rim of subendocardium is truly ischemic, and that's because there's lack of augmentation. And there's a few reasons why this happens. It could be that there is you know, just small vessel abnormalities uh, due to abnormal myocardial architecture, just true demand um, you know, mismatch, there's such significant hypertrophy, or there's impaired LV relaxation, increased LVDP, all leading to microvascular ischemia. Um, and this was a paper that uh, was published in the NAGM, I think in 2003, and just shows that 
PET is not very helpful in diagnosis. I will say, you know, this case is a good highlight of that. However, it's, it could have some prognostic implications. So patients who had uh, decreased flows uh, were the patients who had the most unfavorable outcomes, which included uh, kind of progression to uh, significant symptomatic heart failure, stage three, four, um, implantation of ICDs, uh, sudden cardiac death, et cetera. So again, like Dr. Amala mentioned, maybe not a great diagnostic tool. If it's negative, great, but if it's positive, it's not very specific, you have to kind of get the next step. Um, however, it could have some prognostic implications, but I would not say that order them just for you know prognostication of these patients just yet. Um, my last case, Mr. Uh, Lee, he's a 60-year-old patient, um, has a significant history of metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma, he's on chemo, he gets admitted with shock, has MSSA bacteremia, and in the ICU he has a bedside ultrasound which shows that he has severely reduced EF, he has a pretty abnormal EKG, and his high sensitive troponin peaks at 450. This is his EKG, I think most people would agree it's quite abnormal. And this is his echo. Excellent, Sabine. Helene said taco soup. Very good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the basal segments, like Salim said, are hyperdynamic. The mid to distal segments are essentially akinetic or severely hypokinetic. And in your mind, you start thinking, could this be takasubu? However, you have a troponin that's elevated, and the patient has risk factors, so they get a uh, cardiac pet. <laughs> um, and so I, does anybody want to interpret the pet? Any of the demo slides? Yeah. 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 And Takasobo is a diagnosis of exclusion, so you want to get some sort of good, robust study to rule it out. Okay, so I will say that there is a mid to distal defect in almost all three territories. And it's fixed essentially. You know, it's the same at rest and the same at stress. The bases are um, have essentially normal perfusion. Oh, I didn't know. That's, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Who's going with, I, didn't, I thought nobody wanted to take the gander. You can help me with Thank the. You, very much, <laughs> you can help me with the flow data. So they can help us with the flow data, though. What do you think of the flow, Salim? They augmented there the septum more than the other, the lateral anterior inferior pores. And the septum augmentation is okay, but the rest is less augmentation. And what do you think of the total peak flows? 1.5. So but I mean, the septal is the one that probably have adequate uh, flow reserve for the other segments, I would say, not anterior so inferior and lateral. The global flows are kind of borderline, and the peak flows are severely reduced, and they're kind of in all three territories. Um, the patient, you know, we kind of reported what we exactly how Salim mentioned this extensive size, uh, mid to distal kind of uh, defect that's fixed, and while this could be typical of mid to distal LAD, given that it traverses three vascular territories, it could be Takasubo keeping in mind the patient's clinical presentation. However, Takasubu is a diagnosis of exclusion and a pet should not have been ordered on this patient. Um, and, you know, a coronary angiogram showed non-obstructive disease. And uh, when, on follow-up, the patient had improvement in EF um, on just medical therapy. And so, uh, really, if you do a literature review on what nuclear studies look like in Takasubu patients, you're going to get a mixed bag. They sometimes get fixed defects, they sometimes get reversible defects. They also have some unusual FDG metabolic uptake. Um, uh, but again, none of that could be diagnostic or helpful. And so if you're thinking Takasubo, we'll think about maybe an MRI or a coronary angiogram or a CTA, uh, but not a pet. Um, so those are the three cases that I have. Did you yeah. I mean, Honestly, if you're the cardiologist taking care of the patient, you're chasing the numbers, you're chasing the EKG, but if the clinical syndrome looks like a Takasubo, wait, as long as the patient is not electrically unstable, hemodynamically unstable where you need to investigate whether he does or does not have coronary disease, but the PET led to the cath, and then the cath ended up with a repeat echo that was normal. So at the end of the day, the imaging has to guide management, but at the same time, I guess you have to choose your tests wisely. Otherwise, you might end up with, with a complication from cath or 
some other uh, unwanted um, effects from your interventions. But I think, uh, you know, the patient was in shock, was in the ICU, the patient, you know, the team was kind of worried about the patient's clinical scenario and just wanted to make sure that they weren't missing something sinister. Let me just play a little devil's advocate. I mean, I think, Mohammed, in a case like this, you need to know. Right. I think, sure, you know, a tincture of time will tell you if it's Takasubus, what if it's not? What if two weeks later you find out, no, this was an LAD lesion, right? So these are cases that can't miss things, you can't miss them. So I think this is a case where you do need to investigate early on um, because there's significant wall motion amount. Maybe it's reversible, but if it's not, or if it's due to coronary disease, you want to know about it as quickly as possible. One question I have for you, I noticed on everything we looked at here were the kind of the processed images. Do you routinely look at the raw data or is it always just looking at the kind of the false color map processed images? We look at the raw data and that's kind of like the, the polar maps are there to help us and guide us, uh, but they can be off sometimes. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you, for example, did not put your valve loop plane in the right direction, you could create a defect, you could miss a defect. So you want to always train your eye to the changes in count, the, the, the difference between Stress. Yeah, so I think that's the key thing is always don't just rely on kind of process data. Make sure for these presentations it would be nice to look at the raw data as well. I'm going to switch out our presentations. Okay. Oh. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So I have some interesting cases where I'm going to kind of shift from PET. I mean, I'll go back to PET, but I'll start initially with CT. So we have a 59-year-old male with a history of hypothyroidism, diabetes, who basically comes to the clinic for possible cardiac pain. So what he says is that he's been having some discomfort, sometimes at rest, but mainly when he really exerts himself like riding his bike. His cardiologist, uh, he also has a family history of like early CAD in the father, I think age 50 or something, and father underwent cabbage. Six months ago, his LDL was 177. Uh, his cardiologist started him on a statin, and the LDL came down to like about 90 during this admission, this visit. Uh, his A1C is 7.3, so he is diabetic. And so, in looking at this story, his primary cardiologist says, you know, this guy is riding his bike every day. Let's do a stress EKG and an echocardiogram. I would say it's pretty reasonable at that point. So. The echocardiogram comes back at an EF of 45, 49, global, no regional wall motion with no valvular heart disease, and he undergoes the ECG stress test. So he runs for about nine and a half minutes. He doesn't come off for any chest pain. He actually comes off for back pain. His uh, heart rate goes up to 102%, and his blood pressure also goes up pretty nicely. Nothing abnormal from that standpoint. And then these are the EKGs. So pre-test, you see he has some non-specific T changes, but SCT changes, but otherwise, not that bad. Stage two, peak exercise, it's kind of very noisy, but again, nothing overt. At two minutes of recovery, he starts to have these, uh, one minute, yeah, so at recovery, he starts to get these ST depressions, specifically in two, and they go all the way up in the precordial leads as well, to be five at two minutes. But they persist at even four minutes, and at four minutes, again, they aren't classic, but they are some things which just don't go away. So seeing this entire picture, the general cardiologist calls it a ST depressions at maximal exercise and at recovery, suggestive of ischemia, and let's get a next test. So at this point, uh, his cardiologist decides he's a 59-year-old. He probably doesn't have a lot of CAD. 
would be false positive. So it ends up sending him for a CTA. And so in this case, um, the coronary CTA was done. So what we do over here is mainly prospective dated CTAs with some variations. Uh, on the dual source scanner with 120 kvp was this patient. And as you can see, he's kind of a really good patient for a CTA because his heart rate is 52. And it, there, there's not a lot of variability. Um, so you're going to you expect to see decent images. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yes. So the way that we're doing it is being a prospective CTA. Our coverage is about four centimeters. Z-axis coverage is about four centimeters. So basically, we'd have to go through at least like three scans prospectively to get the entire data set of the heart. So in this situation, the patient went through, this was the initial, then second, so one heartbeat later, and then this heartbeat. So this was kind of like mid-systolic, uh, or no, and yeah, mid-systolic imaging. So Anish, what does Siemens recommend? What, so, what does the manufacturer recommend that you scan this? So a manufacturer would recommend to scan in end diastole. Uh, and that's again I would say late diastole. Late diastole. Yeah. 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 Anything with yeah. heart rate less than 60, the best picture is going to be the best art that you are happy with. In diastole. Yes. And not, it's not it's 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 some variability, that's why. Yeah. And also the confidence of the first one. So yeah, but, thanks. Uh, that's basically essentially why they end up scanning this patient. What does the planning scan show? Uh, planning scan did show some calcifications, but it didn't show like a calcium score of above 1,000 or so. 1,000? It was not above 1,000. It was lower than that. I think 200 or 300. Well, even with that variability, I mean, uh, wouldn't you expect to get a motion free image? Uh, I mean, the variability is not that significant. Yes. Probably a bit of silence of the end. So that's... Yes. That's actually a question right now. This is not a question. There's a big part of it. A few papers right now. People are now switching to have systolic as their standard. And because in ancestry, you're getting better RCA imaging. So there might be a merit to doing routinely ancestolic imaging. Yes, and I think it, it, in this situation, I think it's, it's trying to catch the best image and what's your best bang for your buck in this situation? You could have done, and I don't think there was a, a wrong answer here. At the point of the image acquisition, what's the tech more comfortable with? And in this situation, I think when you can see a T wave or you, you know that you're getting a T wave, techs are more comfortable, at least here, with doing these ancestolic imaging. And I don't think we have a really drop in quality because of that. So I think. We could have gone either way in a patient like this, but in ho faster heart rates, definitely doing the end systolic imaging gets you better bang for your buck. So moving forward, I, basically in this situation, again, it's very hard to show the entire CT scan, unlike the PET. Uh, so I'd, I'd had to kind of condense it to what was the most important finding in the CTA. So what do you see on the left here is multi-planar reconstruction of the coronary artery, specifically the LAD. So over here, you have your aortic root, then you have the ostium, proximal LAD, uh, diag one coming off, and then mid-LAD. The 3D representation is just so that you guys get used to, or for people who are not used to CT, as to what we're actually seeing, uh, as well as this is basically a slice reconstruction of this region, two millimeters above and two millimeters below, to try and find and see what's going on within the lumen. So I don't know, I think it's projecting decently, but when you see this, the white structure in the middle, that's the lumen. And as we go down the artery, right at the center here, so the, where the red dot is, the lumen is very narrowed and it continues to stay narrowed up until about a millimeter or two after, and then it comes back normal. So what we ended up 
calling this particular CTA was, or for this particular LAD was diffuse LAD disease with about fo a focal 70% stenosis in the mid LAD right after the D1 takeoff. And so moving forward, we also found there was a um, disease in the RCA, but this was again moderate disease, non-obstructive. We did send this patient for a uh, computational dynamic or uh, analysis or CTFFR. Specifically, we send it here to HeartFlow, and that's the vendor. And in this situation, we will go into more depth of the CTFFR, but this is just a snapshot of what we actually got in this particular patient. Uh, just to walk you through it, and I'm going to start off with just the LAD being the more important artery here. And as you see, that once the D1 comes off, right after the D1, you do get an area of narrowing. Uh, and after that, there is a drop in the pressure, or essentially the CT-derived FFR, to 0.82. But that drop continues throughout the artery all the way up to the distal part to about 0.6. So this entire artery right after that spot seems to have pressure loss, at least derived by CT. How would you not know that there is a distal lesion and it's actually having a translational pressure gradient from yellow? I think yellow is like about 0 0.8 to 0.6, because there was also calcium in that distal LED lesion. So how would you know that this is not two lesions in the same vessel rather than just a... <coughs> Like, you see that plaque? Yes. I don't know how much luminosinosis there is in that vessel, but it sounds like an atomic and it correlates to that drop, southern drop in pressure, and rather than a continuous drop in pressure from, like, let's say, interfeeding or, like, a vessel. I'm curious what you guys think, because it does not look like a step, um, like an abrupt change of them. So I wonder whether that lesion might be the lesion that is causing I think in, in this situation, it's, it's kind of hard, to be honest, because if you even correlate it with anatomy and physiology, unless you actually know if you increase flow in the proximal lesion, you don't know if the flow in the distal lesion is going to get any better or worse. Now, the right answer to this is probably you'd have to fix it and do a real-time FFR at that distal lesion to try and see if that uh, FFR actually changes, but I'm curious to hear what uh, Dr. Alma or anyone else is on multiple lesions. CTFFR will decrease as you go more distal, and with that combination of the proximal lesion and the even has some mild disease in the uh, in the proximal LED, and then you have the severe lesion in the mid LED. That combination of the two, I think, may explain the drop. Yeah, the technical history shows that the transvision of zero point two is the best predictor. Dr. Chang, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Danish registry, they have a, a publishing presented European Society of Cardiology shows that translational drop of 0.2 is the most specific best predictor of improvement in basic FFR to your stank. This case looks like it's a mixture of some stenosis with diffuse disease afterwards, so not the worst diffuse disease, but usually this type of cases when you put the stand in the middle of it's likely that this cause of the stand in the pretty might not restore completely the, 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 the pressure. And then just to finish off on that, in at least the CTFFR image, you do see that there is a, uh, again, a drop in the pressure in the RCA, or specifically the PDA, again, more consistent with diffuse disease rather than a focal lesion. Now we also did see something on the CTA which was that we thought that the RPL was completely stenosed uh, and I'll get to that in just a bit and on the CTFFR section at least the company could not actually even trace that artery so they didn't even call anything there. So obviously he goes to CAT. Um, and that's right, CTFFR only, only yes. Validating vessel more than 1.8 millimeter. Yes. And I mean, if you consider the lesion to be severe, if you consider the lesion to be severe on the initial CT, then you don't really need to do the FFR CT. At least for the most majority yes. of cases. So 
I'll give you the like how things are in the guidelines, and it's not my personal opinion. So the guidelines, per the guideline, this would justify to go to FFRCT because it says anything from 40 to 90 percent, and this is based on invasive data that shows that even lesions that are called on QCA by CAF that are 70 to 90, still a good percent of them did not correlate with invasive hemodynamics. So that's why they kind of push it to be done in this way. Now, I agree with Sumin that the, the most specific way to interpret FFR is that you look one centimeter or 1.5 centimeter below that lesion, that middle AD, and if you look at it, so technically, you can argue that that lesion, that gradient FFR across that lesion is not significant. But if you want to go by the guidelines, it doesn't tell you what it is. So anything below 0.8, so you can see the tip of the vessel 0.6. So by QA criteria, this guy needs cath and that he needed the FFR CT. Probably he's not going to benefit much because of the diffuse nature of the disease and because there is not a huge trans lesion drop in pressure, as Sumin mentioned. I'm sorry, I missed it. Do you have, have Angela? Yes. Yeah, so do you exercise, he did not have any angina. No, he, he didn't have angina during the exercise, but in recovery he has ST depression. And then he says that he comes when he so when he exerts himself on a bicycle, like for a long period of time is what the notes mentioned, he's having chest pain. And we did this uh, um, exercise uh, EKG where he had persistent uh, changes in recovery. Is the outcome going to improve with we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> so either way, I mean, let's, uh, to, to go into the cat, first, first things first is that I think uh, we have to at least try and interrogate what these lesions are like on a luminal angiogram. Um, and in this situation, so just to walk you through the cat um, in the interest of time, left main, and this is LAO cranial, LAD, and right off the LAD, you can see right after that D1 branch, there is a uh, stenosis. And now this was called to be 80% in the cath lab. I'd say, again, in a non-interventionalist size, that does look significant. I'm not going to give a percentage here. Uh, and then this is the LAO caudal view, just for completion's sake. And, and then areocranial view actually gives you a better estimation. Again, left main, D1 coming off. And that's the LAD, and that's the stenosis in question. That's the other stenosis which I think we are seeing on the CTFFR as well as the CT. And in the ario caudal view, another thing which you do notice at least is that the LAD actually gives off a collateral which is going to the right side. The circumflex otherwise doesn't have a lot of disease or if it's all mild disease. The RCA in this situation was, again, mainly called to have moderate disease, but again, no, uh, nothing severe except at that RPL location, where they think that this could be a stump of the RPL. Now, with these images, this is just for, for correlation exactly as to where that lesion was and where that lesion was seen on cath is. And finally, same thing in the other view. So it's exact, I mean, is it a significant lesion, not significant lesion? That becomes a different question, but the fact that we can actually see similarity, that's the first uh, validation for us. Okay. I mean, if we believe the same trial, FFR guided revascularization does improve outcomes. The problem is you have someone with pain, abnormal stress test, obviously the first thing that's going to come to the intervention list is that they're going to end up and stent the guy, unless someone was kind of thinking that this guy goes, goes for 10 minutes on Brewer's protocol, has a one millimeter ST changes, which is definitely, sounds like ischemic, but whether or not on the long term 
stenting would make a dent in his reducing events versus symptoms, it's kind of something to be looked so, at. So, okay, so how would you do it? Okay, so they didn't do an IFR. Their reasoning behind this is that they saw these lesions, not necessarily the CT being positive, they saw the lesions, they saw he's diabetic, and his ejection fraction is mildly on the, on the lower end. They're like, okay, let's not put a stent in, let's take a step back, talk to the patient, get the primary cardiologist involved, and make the best decision for the patient. So this is what ended up happening outside of the cath lab. And then, after speaking with interventional CT surgery, he actually opted for surgical revascularization. They actually gave him uh, an option of medical management, they gave him an option of stent, they gave him an option of cabbage with the CT surgeon, and he picked cabbage because of his father having cabbage before. <laughs> hey, I'm not making these things up. Uh, the interesting thing was he actually underwent an uncomplicated but off-pump Lima to LAD, and he's alive as of like the uh, end of January. Now, the ejection fraction on the repeat echo somehow came up at 60%. That I don't quite know if it re it's real, but... So all the decision was made yeah. without a without any decision. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, how do you resolve the recovery changes? How can you send your bypass and not a You have a bunch of You can develop the changes from the small vessel disease or the vessel that is the other disease. What is the minor lesion? Yeah, that's what I So, we didn't, I have, they didn't, I have far? No. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, placebo effect, maybe. <laughs> but again, it's, it's a tough case. It's not a straightforward case. What makes you think as to if, if you do get a patient like this and you're like, how would you approach it? Because the decision does matter. Was he treated medically before? So he was on beta blocker. Um, a toprolol, I think 50 milligrams, and he was on uh, statin for six months. <laughs> okay, so uh, I am a little controversial, so from one controversial case to maybe the next. <laughs> Unless anyone has any questions before we move on. Yeah, yeah, I'll do this one. This one is quicker. Or, okay. So, second case, 66-year-old uh, female with a history of cabbage in October. Um, and I'm just going to go over this, uh, go over it this way. So, in the interest of time, she has exertional chest pain. She has a stress test in an outside hospital, which is positive. They find her to have critical left main disease. They do Lima LAD, Rima RCA, SVG D1, SVG OM. On 223, during cardiac rehab, she has chest pain. They directly take her to cath. Lima LED is patent, Rima RC is patent, SVG D1 is occluded. And now SVG OM has an 80% stenosis. They put a stent in, send her back to cardiac rehab. Again, in June of while cardiac rehab, she again has chest pain on exertion. Uh, and at this point, uh, the primary cardiologist is like, she's been through a lot let's actually do an ischemia testing to try and figure out what's actually going on and where's this chest pain coming from. And then she has this bed. So in, in this bed, just uh, again in the interest of time, stress on top, rest on the bottom. Uh, we do rubidium pet, and this is rubidium with regadenosome. Uh, there's a large anterior and anterior lateral defect, which extends all the way from the base to the apex and involves the entire lateral wall as well. It's a very large, very evident first-year cardiology fellow can pick up defect. <laughs> with, with the polar maps, uh, it's just interesting to see that there's a large section of ischemia. Hmm? It's definitely <laughs> irreversible, um, but mainly in that, again, that 
lateral uh, as well as anterolateral and even the anterior wall. So the and then yeah, this is basically to show you the flow data. Flows are terrible everywhere, and so I'm going to move on uh, in the interest of time. Where the myocardial blood flow reserve is also severely reduced, and the there is TID as well, indicative of uh, multivessel disease. So interestingly, I think this was a, a crucial point, is that you can jump and send this patient directly to a cath versus actually take a step back and say, okay, this is gonna be a complicated cath. Let's see if we can do something different. So this patient actually ends up going for a CTA, not mainly to look at the lesions or anything, but actually to help out with planning off the eventual cath. Uh, I mean, it makes sense in this day and age when you have really good CT imaging, probably is better for the patient, less amount of contrast utilization as well. And we have a paper which came out recently regarding the same. Question on that. Are you using less contrast? Does CT be less contrast dose than a cath? Yes. Yes. So I think you, for this case, we would use up from maybe 60 cc's to 100 cc's of contrast. In a cat, in a complicated cabbage cat, you may go up to 200 cc's. Yes. Plus, you're fishing around. But it's actually a, a randomized study recently. Yes. Patient I think the European Heart cat. Journal had that published recently. A patient has cabbage going for cat, group that CTA free, another group in Nagash. Essentially, a better soft endpoint outcome, meaning there's doing of air, less radiation, uh, less contrast dose, even a little bit less minor clinical complication as well. So basically doing CTA before you're going to cap the patient with cabbage, it's con I, I think at this stage it should be seriously considered, yeah. especially if you don't know that now. Yes. So did we have the images from the second? We did not. The second, uh, we, we did not. This is all, I think it was an outside hospital referred to us maybe in that June visit. Um, so basic, but again, and to go quickly, the CTA, Rima to distal RCA, patent. Lima to LAD was patent with proximal LAD disease. Um, and the anastomosis was also patent. SVG to D1 was occluded. And SVG to OM now actually had likely severe instant restenosis. Uh, and then knowing this, actually I think the interventionalist plan to just take in and try and see if they can fix the SVG to OM. I think before this, when I had spoken with the primary cardiologist, the thought was that if the CTA, the CTA was not done, they would have had to think about, okay, are they going for a Lima lesion? And do they have to plan the, the, the cath with backup? specifically like Nimpella. This was, again, thought process, not what I get ended up happening, but it's, again, food for thought. These are the cases which maybe you have to think before you go into the cat. And then going into the cat, so the Lima to the LAD was first interrogated, was deemed to be patent, and astomosis was also deemed to be patent. They did see disease, like proximally, but again, not as severe as what we had seen on the CTA. Uh, they actually decided not to interrogate the REMA this time because it was interrogated on the CTA. Um, they couldn't find the OM, oh, sorry, they couldn't find the D1, so they actually did inject in the SVG to the OM, and that's the lateral wall of the LV, and there is a stenosis which is pretty clearly seen actually prior to the stent. And then this is again this. And then this is post and So they obviously they go and fix it. Uh, interestingly, now this patient, after the second stent, actually finally finished cardiac rehab <laughs> with no more chest pain. And she followed up last week. Uh, she's doing well, no more chest pain. She's just scared now. <laughs> but, yep, that, that's all I have for you guys. So in this situation, most likely the ischemia in the LED territory is coming from the unrevascularized D1. Uh, plus it could be from maybe proximal disease. Now, should you go after it or how much of the OM was giving collaterals 
to that uh, segment. If she's having no symptoms, I mean, we're done. So we don't need to keep testing. Like like, yeah. 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 That's the only thing. Is like, I think, luckily, I don't know what the plan would have been if she did not have relief of symptoms. The fact that she had relief of symptoms uh, and she's doing well overall, they said, you know what? This is it. But to be seen, this is all last year. <laughs> what medication are you allowed? So she was she was di she's diabetic. So she's on anti-diabetic. She's on a statin. She's on a beta blocker. I don't quite remember what the dose was. But her ejection fraction is actually preserved, so she's not on like, uh, I think she's on R, but mainly for blood pressure rather than heart failure. And that's great, calcium channel blocker. Right now, I have to double check the um, calcium channel blocker because for blood pressure mainly. No nitrate, that I did check. Hi everyone, I'm Vivek. I have the most straightforward case here for the last. Uh, so this is about a 71-year-old man. Uh, he has a history of AFib, status post ablation, uh, six sinus syndrome, status post pacemaker placement. Uh, so he's also been getting some orthopedic issue and musculoskeletal issues uh, with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar spinal stenosis, and cervical spinal stenosis. Uh, he's also been having some shortness of breath and chest pain. So the electrophysiologist suspected that maybe the patient has amyloid uh, with bilateral carpal tunnel and arrhythmias. So a CMR was ordered. So I just have the single short, single shot short axis bright blood LGE sequence. Uh, there is some LGE mid-myocardial at the basal septum, uh, which you can see in the shell shot here. Uh, the full read was that patient had uh, asymmetric uh, septal hypertrophy with sigmoid septum, 1.3 centimeter. EF was read as 45, and they were read it as a non-CAD scar. Uh, following this, patient went blood testing, meant for blood testing for amyloid. Uh, the AL amyloid blood testing was negative, and patient went for a PYP scan. Uh, which was also negative. Uh, the MRI report also mentioned that patient should be tested for sarcoid because of the focal mid-myocardial non-CAD scar. Uh, so the patient had a uh, MPI sarcoid study. Uh, at the t these are the still images. At the top, we have the stress. Uh, at the middle, we have the rest images. And at the bottom, we have the FDG images uh, for inflammation. So if you look carefully, there is mild uh, basal to mid anterior anterior septal fixed uh, defect and corresponding to that there is FDG uptake uh, in the same region so this and the EF was 40 uh, EF was 45 percent uh, the calcium score in this study was 2100 uh, so there was 44 percent inflammation that came out during this study these are the flows in this study and if you look carefully, the global flow reserve is at 2.1, which is uh, within, uh, the two is the lower limit of normal, so we can say it's within normality, but all the stress flows are severely reduced below 1.5. So to really reduce stress flows in the setting of very high calcium score could suggest multivessel coronary disease. Uh, so this, so after this, so we have two findings here. We have inflammation, on the sarcoid study, but at the same time, we have high calcium score and low uh, stress flows in all three coronary vascular territories. Uh, in the interim, patient is complaining of intermittent chest pain that is non-exertional, and at one point, patient complained of persistent chest pain, so he was sent for a cardiac cath. Uh, so these are the cardiac cath findings. On the left side, we have LA cranial view, and in the LED, you can see that there is a moderate lesion uh, and the uh, proximal LED and uh, osteodiagonal lesion, which looks significant. There is a proximal OM lesion that looks significant, 
uh, patient had an IFR of both the lesions. Uh, for LED, the IFR was 0 0.9, 0 0.91. For OM, it was 0.99, so not significant. Uh, this is the shot of the right side. So patient had severe disease in the mid vessel. It was called severe. And patient had severe disease of the distal vessel going into the PDA. So after this CAT findings, well, what would you do? <laughs> the patient had ch patient has intermittent chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, he's requiring diuretics. Uh, the patient has multivessel coronary disease. The major two vessels, the CERC and LED, not significant for IFR. The IFR was not checked for the right side. So patient had a PCI to the mid RCA and the distal RCA going into the PDA. Now patient was sent to the pulmonologist for the finding of positive inflammation in the myocardium. As per the pulmonologist note, patient has some resolution of the shortness of breath and chest pain, but not completely. Uh, the pulmonologist is concerned about sarcoid. So patient is sent for transbronchial lymph node biopsy because lymph node also had mildly positive SUV uptake. It was, SUV was around 3.1. So patient had two transbronchial mediastinal lymph node biopsy, which is negative. Around six months after the PCI, patient started to have more shortness of breath, more chest pain. Uh, now around that time, patient also had a trigger finger release surgery, and the tissue from that showed faint amyloid deposits. <laughs> okay, so, so after that, uh, they're concerned about amyloid, they're concerned about inflammation, but there's nothing definite, no tissue diagnosis yet, nothing definitive yet. Uh, so a patient, they hold the DAPT, the second antiplatelet, to do an endomyocardial biopsy. And endomyocardial biopsy did not show amyloid or inflammation. It came back. Is this the easiest case? <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Dr. Malach, the, the, on the perfusion images, like, he had a lot of FTG uptake, but no perfusion yeah. defects. What do you think? Yeah. I think you need to... This is one of probably the most complex cases I had to review. So, if you look at it, there are two questions here. The first one is whether this is ischemic or not. I think this is a question that you need to answer before doing any F inflammation FTG because if there is any hibernating myocardium, it will be difficult to suppress that. So in this case, when you have very high calcium score and low flow, I think that's very reasonable to do the, uh, the angiogram and have invasive hemodynamics. So that's ruled out. Interesting that the FTG uptake is most intense in the areas of the LGE, which is like the basal antireceptor. It's a little bit more pronounced here. I don't know what was the beta hydroxy for this patient, but um, I think there is some inflammation. So inflammation, although we always tend to think sarcoid, but you have also to think a lot of the mimickers. So one of the mimickers have been suggested to be amyloid if it is faint uptake. There are other uh, reports about some of the HCM mutations causing some local inflammation in these cases. So if you go back to the LGE, maybe the MRI readers, anyone think that this is like uh, an HCM kind of, like is this amyloid HCM kind of LGE pattern? I mean, obviously, there are two diagnostic criteria for HCM. Number one is an absolute wall thickness above 15 millimeter uh, and a septum to posterior lateral wall ratio to 1.3. But if you do have family history of HCM, then actually a septum wall thickness above 13 and a septum to lateral wall ratio more than 1.1, but you have to have that positive family history. Uh, to have a lower cut threshold. In this case, we don't know whether he does or does not have. But what is interesting is that all the orthopedic signs were pointing towards one disease pathology, the biopsy in the synovial tissue. Usually you develop late cardiac manifestation of amyloid because it usually hits multiple organs before it starts to infiltrate your heart. So I hate to say, but there might be two disease processes in, these, in this patient that are probably not related to each other.
thank you for all the comments. So, and in a prospective study, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, only 6% of these patients developed clinical cardiac amyloidosis after up to 10 years, I think, in that study. So I think that's something to keep in mind, too. But there is something going on in the basal antireceptum. You need to have some tissue diagnosis to know what it is. It's by going by age and others, it's unlikely to be sarcoid. It's probably some other inflammatory cardiomyopathy that you need to tease out. Uh, Dr. Shah. So one of the things that in a case like this would be useful is to look at the cine images as well, right? So, I mean, you can, we don't have them here, but can you tell us what the cine images showed? Uh, CINE showed mildly reduced uh, ejection fraction. There is no obvious uh, wall motion abnormalities that could be seen. The basal septum looked mildly thickened, but there is nothing. Right, and, and the signal on the CINE in the basal septum looked normal, or there was an increase in signal? I will have to go back and look at yeah, it. Yeah, because I mean, oftentimes just looking at that alone can tell you, because again, when you see LGE, it could be chronic, it could just be chronic uh, fibrosis from a variety of different etiologies, or it could be some acute process, right? So oftentimes the CINE can be helpful in that setting. If the CINE signal intensity is the same in that area as the rest of the myocardium, that suggests it's not a, an acute process versus you see an increase in signal. The other thing, I mean, you know, as we do lots of MRIs on these people, I mean, this is a very sensitive technique to identify myocardial abnormalities. We have to be careful to not kind of start chasing down, right? Because we're kind of chasing down multiple different things here. And sometimes I would say stop and look at the clinical scenario because, again, having basal, you know, this area of LGE, to me, I would say it's a nonspecific pattern based on what you've seen so far. Uh, and so I think we, get, we have to be careful because we can get into this cascade of just one test after another after another, and in the end, we don't actually end up coming up with a diagnosis. Or worse yet, if we get some false positive tests somewhere in the middle, and we start treating this patient for some disease state that they may or may not have, there can be consequences to that. So I, I guess I would just urge caution to all of the MRI readers, just because you see an area of LGE, don't just automatically then trigger a cascade of additional testing, please. Thank you for the comments. Uh, so, patient also got a genetic testing panel for dilated cardiomyopathy and other cardiomyopathies, and patient came back positive for MYBPC3 and TNN2 uh, mutations. Uh, he was heterozygous for it, and these are very well-known mutations for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, patient was also having NSVT in the interim and got upgraded to ICD. Now, following this, patient had worsening shortness of breath, escalation of Lasix requirements, and patient had recurrence of chest pain. So patient gets admitted to an outside hospital and undergoes a cardiac cath again. Uh, so these are the cath pictures. Uh, so this is areocranial and the LED disease has progressed. And there is a timeline of two year difference between the last cath and this cath. Um, so the proxility disease has progressed. You can see there, the vessels are severely calcified. Uh, there is also, uh, so this is areocaudal. I just want to make sure. Yeah, so there is an OM disease that has progressed here. And this is the RCA, where the prox RCA disease has progressed and the stent in the mid RCA is completely occluded. And EF was, again, red as 40 to 45%. So now patient is undergoing knee surgery uh, and patient is getting a PET scan uh, for pre-op clearance and to assess ischemia uh, in the setting of progression of coronary disease. So above is the stress, these are again static images, the stress at the top, rest at the bottom. And we have partially reversible, uh, moderate size, medium intensity, defect in basal to mid inferoceptum, inferior and inferolateral walls, uh, and a fixed mild defect in basal to mid anterior and anteroceptal walls. So we have both ischemia, uh, likely related to the RCA, and we have the fixed defect related to the scar we saw earlier. And this 
uh, these are reconstructions, but let's go to the flows. So the stress flows are reduced somewhat more, and now the rest flows are a little bit higher here, but the flow reserve is now reduced. The calcium score is 4,000. So now, again, so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes. The stand was included in the council. Uh, but, okay, so, although we have ischemic defect in the inferior wall, regardless of whether the lesions are IFR positive or negative, there is diffuse epicardial disease with reduced flow and flow reserve in all three coronary territories. So, just you have multivessel ischemia in the setting of stent plus high calcium score. So, uh, what do you think? Multivessel disease, sarcoid, amyloid, and HCM. Yeah. Hibernation doesn't explain the LGE that you saw. I think I looked at this chart before I came, and the guy was having a lot of arrhythmias. So the trigger of testing was kind of justified, I have to say, by the amount of non-sustained VTs. He had multiple shocks. He was upgraded. He was taken for ablations. And they wanted to be eager to, like, they wanted to know what was the underlying process. So. I mean, the guy has, I mean, obviously has diffuse atherosclerosis, and I think flow here are just a matter of the diffuse atherosclerosis. They're probably not going to add much to what you know, and there are probably some focalities here and there. By fixing that focality, you may have some symptom relief. I think they were trying to do that mostly to see if any of that helps suppress his arrhythmias. But on the other end, what is the primary non-ischemic etiology? I don't know in this case. Probably not sarcoid, maybe amyloid, and maybe some of these mutations that you showed that have been described in some case reports to show some FTG uptake. So whether he has like HCM early on and some of this LGE may be related to it, but again, I don't think I have a definitive answer, but uh, I think a lot of what triggered all this testing in this case was the persistent that we have this patient. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? What's the happy ending? <laughs> well, he's getting a knee, knee arthroplasty for infected joints. Not a candidate for any of the things we would like to do.